it's vitally important for me to reach people. You're right. But did I ever dream when I was a young rabbi in rabbinical school poring over the holy books in Hebrew that God would give me this mission or that I would even have a, a mission in life to reach so many with a message of hope? I don't think that I have to wonder about why I am here with you today and why I'm trying to reach people in this way. It's very definite for me. I know the answer now. I know what God is asking me to do. God is asking me to share my story with people, the story of my struggle, the story of hope, so that they would be lifted up. I was uh, not a very distinguished rabbi. I'm a rabbi here in Newburgh on the beautiful Hudson River. And we have a rather small congregation. And I guess the only thing that distinguished me when I first came here uh, years ago was that I loved running. I was a kind of a running addict. Some people said, Herschel, running is more of a religion to you <laughs> than your Judaism. And I would be up at 4.30 in the morning. And eventually, uh, it wasn't just 10 Ks, but I actually ran the New York City Marathon in 1978 with a t-shirt that my friends gave me and it became my logo. It said, the running rabbi. It's true, I'm, I'm the running rabbi. Uh, never did I dream, though, that I would be running a different sort of a marathon one day. There I was in 1978, at the age of uh, 42 then, running in the New York City Marathon, my wife and my daughters and my friends cheering me on. I was raising my hands in the V sign for victory. Uh, and to me, that was an amazing moment because you feel a part of all humanity. And there were Judy and, and my wife Judy and my daughters Rachel and Nina and my friends, and they were cheering me on. And nothing could have stopped me that day mm -hmm. in doing that marathon. And then, um, just a few short years later, I had to run a different sort of a marathon. It was in the spring of uh, 1982. And of course, in the intervening time, I was the rabbi who visited our hostages in Tehran to give them a message of hope and to try to comfort them. But it was in the spring of 1982, just two years after I visited the hostages, that I became a hostage to leukemia. The weather was warm. I was going out with my buddies to run that spring. And I began to feel strangely and uncommonly tired. And knowing my body like runners do, and taking such good care of myself, because I thought, well, that's what God wants me to do. Uh, I knew that uh, the doctors were wrong when they tried to dismiss uh, the problem and say, well, maybe you have the flu or mononucleosis. No, something was telling me, get ready, Herschel. You have a long battle and a big struggle. And sure enough, in a few weeks, uh, luckily, it was discovered that I had a rare form of leukemia. I say it's lucky, because if they hadn't found out that I had this leukemia, I would have died. And that's where my battle and my struggle began. And uh, here I was, the rabbi who ran in the marathon, and suddenly I couldn't even walk a quarter of a block. Uh, I, I was the rabbi who had comforted the hostages, and now I had to find out how to comfort myself. So I, I think you can see why I grew in a certain direction, because in the process of my struggle, and I want to share that with people, and I do all the time in, in personal ways and when I speak before groups, whether it's for the American Cancer Society or, or anybody who invites me into their lives, uh, when, I, when I do that sort of thing, my goal is very clear. I want to give people an understanding that there is hope, because I was saved by a miracle, and I'd like to tell you and everybody about that. Actually, and I want to show you what could happen. I would like to ask you, what was your first reaction when they told you that you were suffering from leukemia? That's very interesting. Even though the title of my book, which some cancer patients have read, and other people, I hope, uh, the title of the book is Why Me? Why Anyone? But probably that was the wrong title. The title of the book, to answer your question, should have probably have been Why Not Me? 
when I was sitting in the office of the hematologist on that sunlit day in June of 1982 with Judy by my side, and here just a few weeks before that I was running the hills and feeling very indestructible, like God was going to let me live forever. And the hematologist was saying uh, to Judy and me, Rabbi, we are virtually certain that you have a rare form of leukemia. And I think what went through my mind at that moment was not why me, but rather why not me? Why should I be any different? As a rabbi visiting patients for so many years, I knew very well that anybody can get sick, that nobody is immune from suffering, not the rich or the poor or the young or the old or the good or the bad. So I didn't feel uh, shocked. I guess I had that going for me because I was experienced as a rabbi. And I think the first question beyond that and the reaction was, with my fighting spirit, with my running spirit, was to say to the doctor, all right, how long do people live with this form of leukemia? And he said, well, Rabbi, we don't know much about hairy cell leukemia. Uh, we, we really don't know much to do for it. Uh, maybe we can take out your spleen and see if your blood counts back, bounce back. Uh, I said, well, what's the prognosis? And he said, well, maybe six months, a year, five years. And I said, I'll take the upper limit, doctor. And I, I opted for the five years. And that was the, the runner in me, the positive person, uh, the person who believed that there is hope, who would try to give hope to other people. Well, that wasn't always easy for me. And um, I, I remember leaving the doctor's office that day and saying, well, what are you going to do for me? And he said, well, we'll take out your spleen. And I said, well, uh, how long will it be before I'll be running again? That was what was on my mind. There was no thought in my mind that I was going to succumb. But Rabbi, when tragedy comes into one's life, how can they look for hope? How can they look for hope when the prognosis are usually very, very glum? Well, first I want to make a confession. I know that rabbis don't usually confess in that way, but I really have to confess something. In the beginning, even though I was the running rabbi and I was had a lot of bravado when I said, well, I'll be running again, but boy, when I was in that bed and hooked up to those tubes and at the mercy of people I didn't even know and feeling so helpless, uh, I, I'm no different because I'm a rabbi than, than anybody else. And I went through the depression and the feeling of being defeated and you, I would climb one mountain and then the next thing you know, I'd be knocked down again. And I wasn't always all that hopeful but I want to tell you, I want to share with you a story. Uh, one of the most indelible things that ever happened to me, and I, I hope that it will help everybody who, who struggles to, and, and I'll share this intimate moment. It happened to me. Uh, here I was, uh, three years later, emaciated. They tried many things for me, uh, chemotherapy and uh, all, all sorts of treatments, and they just weren't right for my disease, and they hadn't actually discovered anything yet to help me. And it looked like I might not make it. And there I was, I was crippled from some reaction to my drugs, fevers of 105, emaciated, pain almost all the time, uh, just uh, not even being able to keep my eyes open for more than a few minutes. And um, the doctors knew, and I have to give them credit, they knew how important it was for me uh, to still think that I could get in motion and they would force me and the nurses would badger me uh, to go down to physical therapy. And, and it wasn't really that I was going to be rehabilitated. It was more for my, for my morale and were they right. So I went down to physical therapy and I was lying on a mat. First they had to lower me into a tank of water just to ease some of the pain, you know, the healing power of water. And then I was lying on a mat and I happened to look up with my eyes half closed and I saw a young man in a wheelchair. And he was sitting in front of these parallel bars. And the people down there, the nurses and the physical therapists, were saying, come on, Jerry. And they were trying to encourage him to lift himself up onto the parallel bars. And he was grimacing and you could see it was very tough for him. And suddenly they were saying, that's it, Jerry, you did it. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, if, 
if my friend Jerry lifted himself up an eighth of an inch, that was about it. And I, I, I realized then that the cancer must have involved his spine. And I thought, what guts? So as I told you, the doctors were trying to lift my morale. And, and they, were, they were embarrassing me. They said, Rabbi Jaffe, you can't stay in your bed so much. We don't want you to give up hope. We don't like it when you look so depressed. And I was fighting back, and I would say, how would you be if you were like me? And they said, yeah, we understand, but we still want you to get going. And finally, they said the key words uh, that embarrassed me enough to get moving. They said, why don't, you, why don't you try to be a rabbi in this hospital? Why don't you try to pastor to others? And I said, well, well all right, I will. And I remember that young man, Jerry, and late that night, I wheeled myself down into his room. It was about 11.30 at night. And Jerry was lying there in that bed. And if anything, he was worse than I was and uncomplaining. And I didn't know him. He was, he was a young man. And when I, when I entered the room, uh, I said, how you doing there, Jerry? And he said, oh, pretty good, buddy. Is, isn't your name Herschel? Didn't I see you down in the PT? I said, yeah, that's right. He said, well, how was it for you today? Well, that's all he had to ask me. Because I unleashed a torrent of complaints and depress like a litany of depression. And I was saying, oh, Jerry, I don't know if my doctors are ever going to see me. I, I think they're avoiding me. I'm never going to get out of here. And I was going on in that vein with this young man who I didn't know. I didn't know his religion. I didn't know where he came from. And what an inspiration he gave to me. He looked at me and he said, just a minute, Herschel. Aren't you Jewish? I said, yeah, I'm Jewish, Jerry. That's right. He said, wait a minute, friend. Didn't I hear that you are a rabbi? I said, that's right, Jerry. I am a rabbi. He said, well, Herschel, rabbi, I'm a Christian. I don't know much about the Jewish religion, but didn't I hear that the Jewish people are a people of hope? So, Rabbi, why don't you practice what you preach, and why don't you be more hopeful? And I tell you, that young man knew more about the heart and the core of my religion and my faith than I did. That Christian knew more about my religion than I did. He was sending me in the right direction. And I guess that's when I went back to my room, and I thank God for a, a young friend like that that could help me. Jerry didn't make it. But he lives on. You said he sent you in a direction. What direction did he send you? What he was telling me was that he was reminding me that the very motto, the anthem of the Jewish people is Hatikva. That happens to be the national anthem of the Jewish people. And it means the hope. It means that in all the centuries when we suffered, when we were persecuted, when there were pogroms, that the Jewish people never lost hope, even when they were reduced to emaciated skeletons in the concentration camp, they still believed in the coming of a better day, the coming of the Messiah. And of course, we share that with our Christian friends who believe in, in a return. Mm -hmm. So that I learned that if I was to be true to my God, and myself, and my Jewishness, that the worst thing and the, and the thing that would violate my spirituality would be to give up hope. And so the nurses told me that next night, when I had another terrible night, fevers of 105, my body racked with pain, I would get out, out of bed, I would pass out, and they said to me, you know Rabbi Jaffe? They told me this when I was better, and I visited them, and. I could hardly remember any of these things. Half the time, I think, I was hallucinating. They said, you, you're really quite a fighter, Rabbi. You really kept up your hopes. I said, I did? They said, yeah. Well, they said, one night, in the middle of the night, we heard screaming in your room and yelling and banging. I said, really? What, what happened? They said, well, we went rushing into the room. We thought you were having another emergency. And they said, you know what, Rabbi? You were banging on the rails of your bed. And it was like you were in a marathon. I said, in a marathon? I said, what was I yelling out? They said, well, you were banging on the bed.
bed rails and you were, you were cheering yourself on and you were yelling out, come on, Herschel. And that's what I want to tell people, that we have unbelievable spiritual powers and an unimaginable fighting spirit that God has given us. God has given us his unlisted phone number if we just look it up. And I can tell people what it is because I've called it several times. What is it, Herschel? Well, I guess we're talking about that God's unlisted phone number would probably be 1-800-HOPE. <laughs> so you're saying that if God really cares about people, they might question why tragedy occurs. Certainly, I questioned it. As a matter of fact, my friends who came to my bedside, they were so worried that I wasn't angry enough. They, they helped me to bring up my anger. Maybe I was a little too pious and too accepting, and that isn't healthy. This is what I tell cancer patients. This is what I tell anybody who's struggling. The first thing is, don't be afraid to admit your fears, your discouragement. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with your loved ones. Be honest with your God, with your faith. And, and when I could do that, then I began to find some honest answers. And that's when I found God's unlisted phone number. And I'll, I actually remember how it happened. There I was, just finding that every time I made a little progress, I would be knocked down again. And as I say, many times it looked like I wasn't going to make it. As a matter of fact, I met one of my surgeons a few months later after I was uh, revived. He saw me in the hallway of the University of Chicago Hospital, and he left my case when he thought I wasn't going to make it. And he did a double take, and he said, Rabbi Jaffe? I said, yes, doctor. He said, is that you? I said, yes. He says, Rabbi, you're not supposed to be here. But getting back to this uh, question of finding out God's number, I know everybody's eager to find that out. It was when I was uh, being knocked down the mountain, and I started to pray, and I wanted to invoke God's name. And I was a well-trained rabbi, and I knew the Hebrew of the original Psalms, the Psalms that were recited by King David, which bring consolation to so many people. And I started to pray the same Psalms to comfort myself and to reach God, that I had performed for other people. And it wasn't working. I, I was praying Psalm 121, uh, which is so uplifting. I lift up my eyes to the mountains, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from God, who makes heaven and earth. The Hebrew says, Esa Enayel Heharim. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. But I wasn't getting an answer. And it was a sort of a rote prayer, and it wasn't working for me. And then I had an inspiration or an intuition. I think maybe some of my Christian friends gave it to me because they came to pray by my bedside in very personal terms, and, and they were talking to me, Herschel, in the bed and not pronouncing all kinds of pieties and bringing tears to my eyes and saying, God, please help our friend Herschel. He's lying in this bed. He loves his wife, Judy, and his daughters, Rachel and Nina, and he wants to be back with them as a father and as a husband. And I guess I, I remembered that, and I said, oh, let me try to pray the way my Christian friends pray. And so I made up my personal prayer to God, and I said, I didn't say, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. I said, God, Lord, I'm trying to get up this mountain, and I'm so weary. I can't keep my eyes open. And God, every time I get up a little ways up the mountain, I get knocked down again. I, I can't make it on my own anymore, but God, I think you can help me. Would you be kind to me? Would you comfort me? Would you hold my hand tight? And would you help me to get up a little way up the mountain, not all the way up. I'm not asking that. And please hold me tight, Lord, and don't let me fall all the way down into the abyss. And that prayer began to work, and that's when I knew what God's unlisted phone number is, and that's what I want to tell everybody out there who is in trouble, and it, it doesn't have to be cancer or leukemia. 
It could be AIDS. It, it could be emotional adversity. It could be the battering that we take in life that assaults us from so many directions. It could be a young teenager who feels alone and lost and who is despondent. It could be an old person who says, I'm weak and I'm frail and what's the use and who cares about me. It, it's really all the same, whether it's emotional or physical. So being religious in the literal sense is not necessarily the key to this 800 number. Yeah. I have to, it, it bothers me, and I quarrel with, with people who come to my congregation. You know how most people join a temple or a church? I think it's true for both. With an apology to the, to the minister or the rabbi. They say, well, I'm, I'm here, rabbi, but I'm not religious. Don't, don't make a mistake. And I used to listen to that, and I confused it. And I used to say to myself in my early days, that's right, they're not very religious. They haven't been to temple very often. They don't light the Sabbath candles. Until I really learned the definition of religion and not to confuse it with observance. Now I tell people, you may be a lot more religious than you think you are. And I ask them a very simple question. Why are you here? Are you in trouble? Are you searching? Are you trying to reach God? Are you looking for help? Are you looking for answers? That's religion to me. Are, do, you, do you know about being decent? Do you want to be a decent person? That's the sum total of every religion to me. So you think that a lot of people come to you when they feel helpless and powerless because they're faced with tragedy? Yes, I do. Uh, at every moment, and thank God, when these people come to me, I'm able to give them something, and thank God, there are miracles. You know, I had a miracle. The doctors thought for sure that I wasn't going to make it, and, and then suddenly, when all else was lost, when there was nothing more to help me, my spleen had been taken out, I had had a rare form of tuberculosis, uh, the chemotherapy didn't work, and they thought I only had a, maybe two or three more weeks to live. And suddenly, there was found a drug for me. The drug is called interferon. Word was flashed in the medical world. Doctors had tried this drug on a few patients down in Texas at a hospital there. And all of a sudden, I was clinging to hope again. I was lying in a hospital here in the Newburgh area, wearing a mask, very vulnerable, frightened, alone. Any, you know what it means to wear a mask. That means that any germ could kill you. And we heard about this, and all I prayed for is, God, give me the strength. Let me live another 30 days, because that's what they said, you know, until they could get me this permission. And oh, boy, it was close. The next thing you know, I was wheeled out of the hospital there in Poughkeepsie, taken by ambulance to Stewart Airport. It was the same airport. The hostages landed there, and now I was a hostage to my own disease. And a little angel of mercy plane took me with my wife, Judy, by my side. My eyes were rolling in my head. My respirations were shallow. They thought I wouldn't make it. Where were they taking me? They were flying me to the University of Chicago Hospital. A plane happened to be going my way. I mean, this was not a plane that was sent for me. It's just that there was a plane taking off from Stewart Airport at that very moment to Chicago, to the right airport, to Midway Airport. And they said, Rabbi, we can take you. You're a cancer patient. We want to help you. It's called the Angel of Mercy flight. And that night, I arrived. And perhaps I had only a few days to live. And my doctors called the FDA and the laboratory, the Shearing Laboratory that made the drug interferon. And they asked for compassionate usage to try to save me. Isn't that an amazing, compassionate usage? Why did they need special permission to try to save me? Well, it was because I was so sick. You know the joke, the doctors don't want you to die and ruin their experiment. Uh, so I didn't fit the norm of, uh, of the protocol. And they had to ask emergency usage to try to save my life. And the next thing you know, my blood count started to rise. The fever started to abate. The drugs that they gave me the t for the tuberculosis, they did their work. My eyes opened a little wider. And well, 
my, my doctors like to say I, I was resurrected. <laughs> I know that's not a, the right word exactly to use about a rabbi, but my doctor's Jewish, and it happened that, uh, that it was Christmas when all this happened, Christmas. Um, so my, my Jewish doctor gets carried away, and every time I visit him for my checkups, he turns to everybody who listen and says, remember the Christmas that we resurrected the rabbi? <laughs> Herschel, you had wonderful circumstances, and you might call it divine intervention, and, and you have been saved, and you, and you are considered a miracle. But what about the people who perhaps don't have a miracle drug on the horizon? Have they been abandoned? No, no, not at all, and I, I want to speak about that. You spoke about divine intervention. When I speak to people, especially when I speak to large audiences, they're the, the doctors and the medical people in the audience, when they listen to me, say, thank you, Rabbi, for not attributing your rescue entirely to faith. And the spiritual people in the audience say, thank you, Rabbi, for not attributing your rescue entirely to medicine. What I believe and what I want to tell people is that it takes both. We God has given us the greatest skills for healing. And in spite of what we think now about um, the medical world, I know there's a disillusionment going on, but still there are doctors and nurses with great nobility. I'm married to a nurse who is a very noble person and who took care of me. Uh, we, we are bonded to God through the instruments he has given us. Particularly in Judaism, we believe that that the healing professions are very sacred. And we're not allowed to leave things entirely to faith because a lot of that faith is the faith that we can find healing and, and we can find the answers. But, so I wanted to set that to rest. But you're asking me, what do I say to the people who didn't make it? I want to say this. Too many times we talk about the people who win out over cancers as victors and the people who lose as victims. Too many times in life, as a matter of fact, we talk about the people who emerge as number one, that they're the victors and the everybody else is lowly and victimized. Oh, no, no, no. We're all very precious in the eyes of God. That young man I spoke to you about, he didn't make it. He died at the age of 28. But can we say about my friend Jerry, that he died hopelessly. Look at the hope he gave to other people. Look at the quality of his life. Look at the inspiration. And look, if I can sermonize, at the people walking around in my congregation and in many congregations with all the riches in the world and all the material goods and acting really as if they're not alive uh, because they're wasting all their opportunities and maybe they're even shortening their lives by taking drugs and ruining this wonderful opportunity God gave to us. Now, also I would say, so we should never talk about the people who didn't make it as victims or having lost. Everybody can be triumphant. We don't know how long this life is going to be. And in the beginning I thought, oh my God, if I only have six months, Oh, what's the sense of it? Why, why? That's not worth much. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't try. And then, when I realized what the love of my friends, seeing my daughter on the ice, doing her ice skating, my running buddies coming by and, and kidding me about running again, and I said, and I realized that every moment is precious. That's what God wants of us, that with every breath we take, we have to glorify Him. So I didn't know how many months I was going to live, but I did not feel despondent over the short span of life. Ah, but you say, Rabbi, but isn't it a tragedy if somebody only lives to a young age? Yes, I, in my religion, we don't deny that there's tragedy, and I don't pretend to know all the answers, but what I do know is that as long as we do have life, we have to make the most of it. When you were so sick, did you feel that your life was out of your control? 
in the beginning, uh, in spite of my bravado of saying that I would be running again, and of course it didn't work out that way, because I uh, had to have more surgery, and uh, I, all of a sudden I wasn't in control, and that's very tough for a spiritual leader to succumb to. You're so used to being in charge, and I had to let other people help me, and, and I, I hated that at the beginning until I realized, my God, these people are sent by God to try to help me. I better let them do their work and not fight them and, and cooperate in my healing with them. Uh, but re returning um, to the question, I'm just trying to conjure up the question again. Can you conjure it up for me? Yeah. How did you gain control of your life? How did All you right. get things back in your control? Were you able to get them back in your I control? I lost a lot of control, as, as I've plainly confessed. I think I started gaining control when I was willing to give up control. I think I started gaining controls over my fears when I stopped trying to suppress them. When somebody comes to me and tells me that they're frightened, or they're frightened for their loved one, I say to them, instead of hiding from your fears, let's say that it's the middle of the night and you're alone and it's dark, and you're vulnerable like a little child, and if you're in a hospital, you're even frightened that the door will be closed and nobody will hear you and you won't be able to reach the buzzer to call the nurse for help. What do you do then? Do you run away and do you hide? I, I did that at the beginning until I learned how to comfort myself, which meant not to hide from my fears, but to let them all out in front of me. And to sit up and to say, Herschel, why are you frightened? Oh, you have a reason to be frightened. You could die. But Herschel, you, you haven't died. You're alive. And you have a responsibility to fight. I don't think I use the word responsibility. I probably said you, you got to fight with all your might. Because I knew that God would be disappointed in me. And I knew my loved ones would be disappointed. And loved ones have to be tough enough to be able to call upon that person who is ready to give up and to say to them, please stay with us, Mother. Please stay with us. Speaking of your loved ones, Herschel, oftentimes it was up to you to hold them together, to hold your family together, because they were as frightened as you were. How do you... How did you hold your family together during that crisis? The key I learned is not to circumvent, not to pretend, not to deny. Uh, I, I remember in the beginning of my disease, you know, my mother's from the past generation and people didn't even want to use the word cancer so, uh, or leukemia and, and she was telling people, Herschel has anemia. And I said, Mother, don't say I have anemia, say I have leukemia, I want people to know, I want the truth to be out. How are people going to help me if they don't know that their friend is seriously ill? Now, in direct answer to your question about rallying your family, I think it has to be out in the open. I didn't try to hide it from my daughters when I was going for my blood counts. Now, they weren't always able to deal with it, but um, if I came home and they said, Daddy, what did the doctor say? I would tell them in simple terms. And I think we had a little scene on summer vacation, as I remember it, when they were just pretending as if nothing was wrong with me. And then I became a little selfish, and there's nothing wrong with that. And the tears came, and I said, I need you to be closer to me. Maybe you don't realize it, but I'm, I'm feeling a, a little bit forsaken now. What should a family know when a member is faced with a crisis or a tragedy? A family should know not to listen to predictions and statistics and dire results. A family should concentrate on the hope that is possible. A family should not run away and hide. The saddest thing I see is when people say, oh, Rabbi, I can't visit my mother, I can't visit my son, I just can't deal with those terrible things. Well, what kind of a world would we live in 
if everybody said, don't let me get near anything sad or serious, I can't deal with it, how would we ever be able to comfort one another? So what the family must know is not, not to hide their tears and not to refrain from being upset, but to get right in there with the person and deal with the issues and be, have enough tough love to be able to say, come on, get going. And my wife Judy did that for me. When I wanted to lay in my bed and I wanted to disintegrate, and I will never forget that cold winter day, and Judy said to me, Herschel, we're going out. You can't lie in this bed. I'm not going to treat you like a hospital patient forever. I got enough hospital patients as a nurse in the hospital. And I said, there goes that woman to torture me. She's going to let me freeze out in the snow. And just to fight her and to prove that she was wrong. I got into my overcoat and I put my scarf down and I was staggering down the stairs and I said, that woman wants to get rid of me. She wants to collect on the life insurance. And I was muttering and cussing and I said, all right, how far do you want me to go? And it was snowing. It was cold. It was the winter time. I said, 10 miles? She said, no, Herschel, just what about about 50 yards up to that next lamppost? And so I said, all right, I think I can do that. But then something beautiful happened. It's a love story, but that's what life is about. I didn't really go alone. As I got to the bottom step, and I was frail, and I was hurting, suddenly her arm was in mine. And she said, here, Herschel, let's go together. That's what I say to the family. Walk by the side of the person who is in difficulty. Tell them that you love them and show them by holding their hand, by physical contact, by listening to their fears. And don't let them shut you off, even if they seem angry, even if they seem too weak and too frail. I knew deep down when people were doing these things for me, and I don't, didn't always react in a kind way, but I knew afterwards that they really cared about me, and that's the important thing. You know, as a rabbi, the saddest thing I see is walking in a hospital corridor and seeing somebody who's alone who has nobody. Herschel, many times in tragedies we turn to prayer. Why do you think some people's prayers are answered and some people's pra prayers apparently aren't answered? What a question. What a question. Something that I've struggled with my whole life and I'm not so sure I'm that much closer to it. I was reading something by a bishop on an airplane, by a Catholic bishop, it struck me about this question I want to share with you and everybody. Sometimes people say, Rabbi, uh, we prayed and we prayed and our prayers aren't answered. And they're thinking about the tough times and the illness and the adversity. And they're angry with God. And they're saying, how could there be a God if he let this happen? Now, what did my friend the bishop say in his article that I read on the airplane? He asked the question, how many times when good happens to you, do you turn around and pray to God and say, thank you, God, for all the good? I think sometimes we have things a little bit out of kilter. But the real question you ask is a very deep theological question, and I do not presume to have the answer. I believe that what we do through prayer is where we reach into the depths of our spirituality to find a fighting spirit, to give our life a purposeful meaning, to act with dignity. If it comes out that we don't make it, it doesn't mean that our prayers weren't answered. You know, in the concentration camp, there were people who went into the flames, but they taught an imperishable lesson for all humanity. They taught us that message of hope. What a legacy. So many times we're looking for answers. We want to hear definitively that this will happen and that that will happen and the predictable, people are comfortable with predictability. And so often in, in the face of tragedy or uncertainty or catastrophic illnesses, there aren't any answers. A, a, wonderful, a wonderful question and we have to speak about that. There's the story from the Jewish tradition 
of a of a young student who is who is living in terrible times in Eastern Europe, when there were the pogroms and the anti-Semitism and the famine. And he went to his rabbi, and it was the time of the holiest day of the Jewish year. We call it the Day of Atonement, when we ask God to forgive us for our sins and try to find the strength to go on. And he said, Rabbi, I just can't pray. I don't even know if there is a God, because people are suffering, people are sick, people are dying. And Rabbi, you tell me to believe, and you tell me to recite these prayers. And the Rabbi didn't say a word. He, he was sitting in a, in a little hut, and there was a fire going rather weakly, and the, uh, the, the ember, it was just the dying embers, and it was getting cold in that hut where the Rabbi was sitting with this student who was so depressed, and who said he couldn't pray, and he didn't know if he could believe in God. The rabbi didn't say a word, but what a lesson he taught the student. He took the poker by the fire, and as the student was speaking this litany of sadness, the rabbi took the poker and he heaped the dying embers a little closer to each other. And of course, what do you think happened in that little hut? that was so cold when the rabbi heaped the embers closer together. Th there was a renewed burst of warmth and light. And the student was watching this. And the rabbi didn't say a word. And the student said, oh, I see, rabbi. I see what you mean. Well, what, what do we see? What do we learn? That in this world, that we can be in the place of God, in a dark world, when prayers seem to go unanswered and unfulfilled, that God has sent us to help one another. Because we are like those embers. When we're alone, when we're cold, when we're indifferent to other people's suffering, then there's not going to be any healing. And it's as if God isn't a reality. But when one human being holds the hand of another, when we all hold each other's hands, then, like the embers in that fire, I think there comes into our life a renewed burst of warmth and light, and I believe that is the presence of God. Rabbi, do you believe in miracles? Yes, I, I believe very, very strongly in miracles. There are different kinds of miracles, and in my religion, we have an interesting definition of the word miracle. The Hebrew word for miracle happens to be nes. And some people may know the word miracle by the story of the Hanukkah lights, of how the oil burned for eight days, even though there was enough oil only for one day. And I won't go into that old legend. But we say a prayer when we get up in the morning and we use the word miracle. Thank you, God, for all the miracles. It means that life itself is a miracle, the possibility of life of love, of the ties that bind us to one another. Yes, even the adversity that teaches us and transforms us and makes us a better person. And I feel I am a better person. I didn't ask for this suffering, but I feel that I have made something more out of myself. And I think that that is the true meaning of miracle. Miracle can also be something that happens because of human willpower, because of spirituality, or the miracle of a rainbow, isn't that miracle enough? It doesn't have to be the intervention of God. Now, I also believe that there are miracles of that order. I, I really didn't believe it when I was a young rabbi, and I was very much on the rational, cerebral side. I have to tell you that I have been in hospitals, and I have seen patients who have been written off, and who doctors give final pronouncements about it, and they really shouldn't do that, because only God knows the answers to those questions. And I have left the rooms of people thinking that they wouldn't be there more than a few hours or a few days, and everything was against them. And suddenly, they are living again. They are vital. 
Maybe they don't live as long as they were supposed to live, but certainly they live to be with their loved ones again. They open their eyes. I, I'm not saying to people that I'm a miracle worker or a faith healer, but I believe that there is great healing in faith, and faith comes through that kind of love. Do you feel that that's your mission in life? As I told you at the outset, I know my mission now. It's a strange word, I guess, for a rabbi to use, but uh, yes, this mission has unfolded for me. When I was in the hospital and the doctor said, Rabbi Jaffe, look at this miracle. Oh, they used the word miracle, by the way. <laughs> and they said, look at you. Look at you. Look how well you're doing. And they put the, my, my, the printouts of my blood counts in front of me because they knew I had to be proven. And it wasn't that I said, God, uh, if you keep me alive, I'll do thus and so. I didn't make that kind of a bargain. But when I was saved, I said to myself, I would be embarrassed if I didn't try to help others through my own growth and my own transformation and the healing that came to me. What is my mission? My mission is to try to spread hope to others. And it's more than just as a rabbi to my own people. Something happened to me in that hospital. A man came to me and he said, I know you're a rabbi. He said, I'm a Lutheran. I guess he thought that maybe I had some special powers. He said, Herschel, Rabbi, w would you pray for me? I, I don't know if you would pray for me, you know. I'm a Christian. And then I realized that we are all children of God. That there was only one true religion, and certainly I knew that because I saw a human suffering, a young teenager on the arms of his parents dying of leukemia. My Lutheran friend who asked me to pray for him, my friend Jerry, who said, I'm a Christian, and shouldn't you be more hopeful, Rabbi, who taught me about my own faith. So I have emerged with this mission in life, and that is to help other people, to give them some example of how to fight adversity, and beyond that, to try to bridge the gap that divides people black and white and yellow and red and Christian and Jew and Muslim. And remember, I saw the Muslim fanatics in Tehran, and if ever I wanted to strangle somebody, it was then. But this is not the way. We are capable of amazing reconciliation. And I feel that there is a great haste to my mission because I've been singed, even though uh, for me the interferon has been a miracle and I'm in a wonderful remission. I'm not counting on anything. The only thing I'm counting on is that God has given me more life, and I'm going to take advantage of it, and that's what I want to, to reach other people with, that uh, they should have more faith, and they should find hope, and they should not underestimate the powers that are, the powers that are within us. One final message that you would like to give? If I were to look into that camera, <laughs> I remember uh, down in Texas, I did a religious television show with an evangelist minister, and I wasn't used to his style. And, and at the end of the show, he said, Rabbi, I want you to look into that camera and tell those people out there how to find faith. Well, I think I'm more comfortable doing that, and I'm more comfortable in, in, in giving final messages. The message I want to give is something which is so important to me. These words from the book of Isaiah, and then I want to quote the Psalms in, in conclusion, if I may, if I can give a, a little bit longer sermon to the faithful. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Just to quote a few words of Hebrew, those who wait for the Lord, those who are struggling, those who undergo immense adversity and who are waiting for God to help them, those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, walk 
and not be faint. My mission is to help people to wait for God, to find God, to be lifted up like on the wings of eagles, to be lifted from their burdens. And yes, in frailty and in adversity, to have the strength to overcome. I know I won't run a marathon the way I did, but just a couple of months ago, I ran the last five miles of the New York City Marathon with a team to raise money for leukemia. And I felt as if I had run the whole marathon. And then these words, which actually conclude my book, I think they're from Psalm 138. When I call to thee, thou didst answer me. And that has a twofold meaning. It means that we can call to God and God will answer us, or we can call to each other. Like the story about the embers, about holding hands. When I call to thee, thou didst answer me, and make me bold and valiant-hearted. And then the conclusion of that psalm is, God, leave not your work unfinished. What I want to tell people is that we have things to do, that even though we are weary and we struggle and we are sick, that we're not expected to complete all the tasks of life. But God wants us to try to do the best we can, and He will never be harsh with us if we do that. And what glory we will give to God, and with what dignity we will live. And God is telling us that. And we are saying to Him, please God, and that's what I said to God when I was struggling. God, I know I have more purpose in life, and I would like everybody out there to try to find a, a purpose. If it's to stay alive for your children, for your loved ones, if it's to do one more loving task, one more good deed, if it's to do right by yourself, if it's to be an inspiration, if it's to help your doctors, if it's to find out more medical secrets, if it's to find faith, leave not thy work unfinished. And I hope that I will be able to keep doing the work that God has given me.